the Great Western Railway. He saw a future where trains would travel at unbelievable speeds. His aim was London to Bristol in four hours. Now, one of the funny little things that you should know about Brunel was that he could draw a perfect circle. But when he took a ride on the bumpy Liverpool to Manchester line, this was all he could manage. He was appalled. He wanted comfort. He wanted a ride so smooth you could sip coffee as you raced along at 50 miles an hour. He therefore had to take complete control. Stations, locomotives, carriages, lampposts, even the width of the track would all be part of his integrated design. Up north, railway tracks were four foot eight apart. About that. And this is because the wagons in coal yards had always had their wheels that far apart and the railway people just copied them. But Brunel wanted his tracks seven feet apart. Let me show you why. It's brilliant. You see, here is a conventional railway track, four foot eight apart, OK? Small wheels with the wagons sitting on top of them, full of coal. Fine. But Brunel worked out that the larger the wheel, the less the friction. And that led to another problem. You see, if you've got a conventional railway track and you fit big wheels, your carriage is up here. Passenger, how's he going to get in? Hopeless. So this is what Brunel thought. Put your tracks seven feet apart, fit the big wheels, and then put the carriage between them. And so you look out of the window through the spokes. Think of the advantages of this. You've got a lower centre of gravity. You've got better aerodynamics. And with those big wheels, you've got less friction. That means better economy and something that changed the world. More speed. Brunel began to tour southern England with this, his walking stick. Except it's rather more than a walking stick. Let me show you. You unscrew the handle, like so, take it off, unscrew this at the bottom, undo this little clasp, pull that bit open, lock it in, pull this bit open, and look, it's a measuring stick. Hmm. Seven feet. Perfect. The other railway owners didn't think the broad gauge was perfect. To a man, they opposed it. Then there were objections to the railway itself, not just from landowners whose estates would be cut in half by Mr Brunel's supersonic iron snake. The Duke of Wellington, for instance, was horrified at the prospect of a railway. It will encourage the working classes to move about, he thundered. And then there was the principal of Eton College. When he heard the railway would be going right past the school, he said it would tempt his pupils to visit the brothels of London. So not only was Brunel charged with the task of designing this railway and getting shareholders to pay for it, he also had to use his considerable PR skills on a sceptical public. This was an immense undertaking. He had to be an engineer, an architect, a spin doctor, a financier, a lobbyist, and even a politician. For 11 days, a parliamentary committee set up to examine the feasibility of a railway all the way from London to Bristol, cross-examined him mercilessly in the witness box. To wake his lawyer in time for the hearings, Brunel hung some string between their apartments on opposite sides of the street. He would pull the string, a bell would ring, and his legal aid was awake. How much would you give to be able to do that to your lawyer? So what woke Brunel up? Oh, don't be silly. The man never seemed to need sleep. He just went on and on like the Energizer Bunny, until eventually, after 56 days, success. The committee was won over, and he could finally get started. 
He wanted to make travelling a pleasure, so the railway had to be efficient and fast. And to get this speed, he had to avoid hills. He went to such extraordinary lengths to avoid a gradient that people started to call the railway Mr Brunel's billiard table. Of course, it wasn't easy. London to Bristol, that's 118 miles of English countryside full of hills, valleys and problems. The first obstacle he faced was this floodplain, about 11 miles to the west of London. Now, the cheap solution would have been to dip the line into it and then have a climb on the other side. But the climb would have slowed his engines down. So, to save a few seconds on the journey time, he built that. 900 feet long with eight arches, the Warncliffe Viaduct is beauty with a purpose. And like the Clifton Bridge, he gave it an Egyptian flavour. The safe suburb of Ealing had never seen anything like it. Even the cavities in the columns between the arches are geometric delights. Like everything on the whole railway, the attention to detail was astonishing. As Brunel said, this was to be the finest work in all of England, not the cheapest but the best. It was a fantastically bold vision, but it took its toll. The stress of it all gave Brunel nightmares. If ever I go mad, I shall have the ghost of the opening of the railway walking before me. And when it steps forward, a little swarm of devils in the shape of half-finished stations, sinking embankments, broken screws, unfinished drawings and sketches will quietly lift up my ghost and put him off a little further. And the nightmares weren't just in his dreams. The next obstacle on his route was the River Thames. The Thames commissioners gave Brunel a rough ride. They wanted a bridge high enough for sailing barges to pass underneath. Brunel wanted a low bridge so that the trains wouldn't need to climb to get over it. Brunel wanted three arches. The commissioners insisted on two. The result was this, a bridge with two enormous 128-foot arches, arches that are only 24 feet high. That's astonishing. That was most people's idea of an arch in the middle of the 19th century. Tall, thin, a bit boring. So when Brunel proposed an arch like that, low and flat and really rather amazing, all the experts said it would collapse. Brunel got to hear of these whisperings and mutterings and echoes. Echoes, echoes. And so, on the day the bridge opened, he left all the scaffolding in place. Aha, said the experts, you see, man's an incompetent fool. Take the scaffolding away, you'll end up with a river full of bricks. But when he did take the scaffolding away, a year later, nothing happened. Bridge stayed up, still here today. And it's still the widest, flattest brick arch in the world. It's a beautiful bridge. Placating landowners and cajoling contractors, Brunel continued to edge west. In Wiltshire, the locals were up in arms. The railway would end passing trade from the coach road and they fought bitterly against the plans. One of Brunel's assistants suggested a team of men should sneak down at night and turn their beloved white horse